Where else can we go, Lord? Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. And so we come to you this evening, longing that we would eat the food of your word and drink the water of your word so that our souls may be fed and our hearts may be quenched of their thirst. Lord, may it please you to speak to us this night as we look at Psalm 120. And over the coming uh, few Wednesdays, we pray that Lord, you continue to enrich us with the wonders of your gospel. So come and be our helper tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight for uh, this uh, midweek service. It's a time of prayer. It's also a time to hear the gospel. It's also a time to be encouraged or to encourage one another. Over these uh, coming uh, few Wednesdays, we are going to be looking at uh, a group of psalms that are often called Songs of Ascents. It's a group of 15 uh, psalms uh, that are recorded from the 120th psalm all the way to the 134th psalm. And tonight, our focus will be on the 120th, which is the first one of 15. We're going to be doing one every week for the next 15 weeks. Uh, let me read. Uh, it's only seven verses. Some of them are, are quite short, only three verses. Uh, the longest one only has 18 verses. The one we are looking at today has got seven, which I'm going to read, and then uh, we're going to look at this together. Psalm 120. A song of ascents. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? Warriors, sharp arrows with glowing coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedah. Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. This is the word of the Lord. It's, it's, it's an amazing um, psalm or rather song to open with in this series. And perhaps you might be wondering this evening, why are they called the songs of ascents? Well, every single one of them, if you look um, in your Bible, might have that inscription or that heading, a song of ascents. And if you look at it in the uh, Swahili Bible, it might be Wimbo Wakupanda, which means going up. Or climbing up somewhere. And so the idea of ascent really is to go up, or it is to climb up somewhere. And we are not really told why they are courts as, as psalms or even songs of ascent, but a lot of um, scholars, perhaps even commentators, say they were perhaps called songs of ascent because they would have been sung by God's people as they were returning to Jerusalem from exile, or perhaps because they would have been sung by pilgrims, that is, believers, whenever they were heading down to Jerusalem or going up the mountains that surrounded Jerusalem. And so they would sing these songs as they longed to come into the presence of the Lord. Others would say that maybe these were songs, songs that would have been sung by priests as they were going up the 15 steps that are in the staircase in the Jerusalem temple. Now, none of these things is within the Bible. Although there does seem to be, uh, perhaps uh, within the Psalms, the songs themselves, evidence of some progression. So, for example, the song we are looking at today is a song of distress. It's a song uh, by someone 
who seems to be in trouble, and especially because he seems to be in a foreign land. And when you move to 121, which is quite popular, many of you will know 121 and even 122, there seems to be movement. He has now come away from a foreign land, and in 121, he says, I will lift up my eyes to the hills, and from where does my help come? Almost appears as if now they have come closer to Jerusalem. They can see the seven hills surrounding the city, and now they seem to be getting closer and closer to Zion, that is the city of Jerusalem and the temple where the Lord covenanted with his people to dwell. And you then see that progression because then in 122, he sings the song that I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And so perhaps that idea of progression of somebody who is far away in a foreign land, who has now drawn closer towards Jerusalem, they can even see it by their own eyes. And now in 122, they are right there. They now are delighting to be in the presence of the Lord. And there does seem to be that ascension. There does seem to be that rising. There does seem to be that moving away from tents of wickedness or even from areas uh, where uh, perhaps it is not within the land of Israel to drawing closer to Zion, to beholding the city and indeed the, uh, the city and indeed the temple and eventually to delighting being in the presence of the Lord. And then the rest of the uh, songs continue within that progression. But whichever way we might look at these psalms, we know that these are songs that, uh, these are songs that would have been sung on occasions of joy. They would have been sung in occasions of desperation because they express hope and longing of God's people for security in the Lord, for confidence in his word and even for joy in the gifts that he has given for his people. And so as we walk, away, uh, we walk our way through these 15 songs, we are going to see some, some of them being quite sorrowful, expressing deep anguish and distress and sorrow, perhaps like the one we are looking at tonight. Others will be much more triumphant and full of joy, like 126, when uh, it reckons that uh, we came back rejoicing, but all of them do express hope in Yahweh. Although some are difficult to read, although others are triumphant, yet all of them carry with them hope in Yahweh. So as we look at them, one, uh, uh, one thing that must remain very clear in our hearts, these are the longings of God's people for the confidence they have in Yahweh who is their Redeemer. The one that we have looked at today, Psalm 120, the Song of Ascend, is a song of distress. In fact, you might even call it a lament. It is sung by a man who, or, or by a person who is in a difficult situation. He opens with verse 1 by saying, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. And then he goes on to tell us the nature of that calling by speaking out, verse 2, Deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips, from a deceitful tongue, he says. What shall be given to you, and what more shall be done to you, you deceitful tongue? He seems to be in anguish. Warriors, sharp arrows, with the growing coals of the broom tree. Woe to me that I saw John in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedah. Too long have I had my dwelling among those who hate peace. I am for peace, says the psalmist, but when I speak, they are for war. The writer of the psalm is praying for deliverance. He seems to be lamenting the lying tongues of those who are around him, or even his own lying tongues, lying tongue. He seems to be in anguish because of the lying and because of the sin of those who are around him. He himself uh, 
Uh, he himself is a sojourner. He says, verse 5, Woe to me that I sojourn, which means he is a foreigner. This is not his home place. He is dwelling among the tents of Kida, he says in part B of verse 5. And so he is a man who seems to be not dwelling in the presence of God. He seems to be far away. Okay? And the people with whom he dwells seem or are, des are described as sinners. That's why he calls on the Lord to deliver him from lying lips, perhaps of those around him, or even of himself, and from a deceitful tongue. And this perhaps echoes those words that we would read in Isaiah chapter 6, when uh, Isaiah sees the vision of the Lord, and he says, Woe to me, for I am a sinful man, and I dwell among a sinful people. So he's a man who is in distress because of the context in which he is dwelling. But in that distress, is um, what he does then in the psalm is to call on the Lord. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. And so there are three important lessons then that we can take away from this particular uh, in the first um, song of ascent. The first one, there is an anguish within the writer of this psalm because of the context in which he dwells. The writer appreciates that he is a sojourner in this place that he calls Meshech and among the people that he calls the tents of Kida. If we look at other references to these City, so to these people, Meshech and Kida, it does point us to the descendants of Ishmael. Clearly, this would, would have been far away from where God's people enjoying God's blessings would have, would have lived. No wonder then he sees himself as a sojourner. And in that context then, he longs for the presence of God. He is in anguish because of the people he dwells with or he lives among, and because of the lifestyles that they lead, and he longs to be with the people of God. He seems to hate the context and to be in distress because of the sinfulness of those around him, particularly their lying tongues, their deceitful tongues. Brothers and sisters tonight, Peter tells us that we are sojourners and we are aliens. Perhaps like God's people out in exile and away from Zion, do we long for the city to which we have been called? The writer here is in distress because of the context. Is that how you would be described this evening? Or could it be that you and I have become very comfortable in the world. Jesus says that you are in the world, but you are not of it. Would that description of uh, Peter, that we are aliens and sojourners in this world, be a fitting description for you and for me? Someone asked rhetorically sometimes, but is it that there is too much world in the church? Or is there too much church in the world? Does it worry us? Does it cause us pain and distress and anguish and we see the corruption all around us, the lying all around us, the deceitful tongues of all those around us? Do we long and look forward, like the writer of Hebrews says, to a better city whose builder and architect is God? But in the second lesson of three here, although the man or the writer is in anguish, he has a posture of dependence. He says, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. His posture is not one of entitlement. He's not one who feels that I have to get out of here. 
He is in distress, but he calls on the name of the Lord. He says, deliver me, that is, rescue me, recognizing there is one higher than him, there is one more powerful than him, deliver me, rescue me, help me. It's a posture of humility. It's a posture of dependence. It's a recognition of a higher power. It is a posture of sort of prayer, going down on our knees and recognizing that unless the Lord helps us, then we are completely destroyed. It is a plea, help me, rather than I decree and declare. The posture here is one who relies on the masses of God. I wonder what is your posture and what is my posture in prayer? I wonder whether often time I come to the Lord feeling very entitled to happen. Oh, these are my rights as a child of God. Yet this would have been God's covenant people who would have been making this prayer. And yet they were in exile. What's their posture? One of dependence. As we look at our world today and we are praying, particularly particularly tonight, we are praying for the education system. What is our posture? We are feeling overly entitled, perhaps to information, to a better curriculum. Perhaps we even think we perhaps know a lot better than anyone else around the country. What are we coming as those who are needy? A proud man or woman cannot pray. What is your posture tonight? But there is something else that we notice from this psalm. He comes to the Lord. Pretty seems pretty obvious, but who is this anguish directed to? He says, I called to the Lord. He answered me. And then he repeats it, must to deliver me, O Lord, from lying lips. He comes to the Lord. And I think it's important to appreciate the value of where our eyes look when we are in distress. In the next psalm, which you're going to be looking at in next week, he says, I look up, I lift up my eyes and look up to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, he says in this second song. And I want to, to suggest to us that yes, we do have um, a right perhaps to, to demand accountability from government, perhaps to demand delivery of services from others. We have a right to want things to be in a particular way. We have a right to demand that vaccines should be delivered. But I wonder where our eyes really are. I think it's very easy to look up to government. For children, it might be very easy to look up to parents. Maybe for spouses, it might just be very easy to know, of course, so and so is going to take care of that. It is very to, to very much leave it to the other person to do it. The writer of the song has got their eyes on the Lord. What does this teach us, God's people? The sovereign Lord has got it all in his hands. And if he has it all in his hands, then our eyes ought to be up to him. Where do you cry when you're in distress? Do you look to yourself as your source of strength or as your source of comfort? Are you looking inward? If we look inwards, we are perhaps going to be frustrated and empty. If we look sideways, others are also in the same anguish as us. If we look to the systems of those around us, they are actually broken. Look at the politics, liars, lying lips, deceitful tongues. 
We look to the systems around, and we get quite disappointed. Where are our eyes tonight? When we think of this as a church family, or perhaps as a wider community, the challenge for us is, where are we looking, really? Or could we just be paying lip service in prayer, but really our confidence is in our hard work? Could it be a prayer, is a ritual, something that we do to tick a box, but our confidence is in our paisley, or our confidence is in our job, or in our business, or in our family, or in our investments, or in our health? Where is your security? For God's people who had been taken away in exile and are dwelling in the tents of Kedah, there was only one way to look up to the Lord. So I close this evening by asking us, where are you looking? Where is your confidence? But I would also ask you that second question. What is your posture in prayer? And the very first one, what makes you angry about the world we live in? Let us pray. In my distress, in our distress, we call to you, O Lord. And you, you who answered your people, answer us. Rescue us, Lord, from lying lips and from deceitful tongues. For we dwell indeed among people of few the lips, and we ourselves often, we are sinners. So we look to you for mercy, for strength, and for grace. Deliver us, O oh Lord. Help us to long for that city. May our eyes be on you. Cause our hearts to mourn and to be in anguish for the world we live in. Help us to long for Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.